in this session we are going to discuss uh, the theoretical philosophy of buddhism the theoretical studies are technically called chhanagavada nairatmyavada and nirvana and bodhisattva now we will discuss chhanagavada or anithyavada it is otherwise known as the doctrine of momentariness in this session on buddhism we are going to discuss the cardinal doctrines of its uh, metaphysics we shall further focus on the buddhist uh, prescriptions to good life uh, in this world the crux of uh, the disagreement between vedanta and buddhism is uh, on the metaphysical question of being or becoming and permanence or change the former emphasized uh, the transcendental reality of atman or the self as the eternal spark of the ultimate reality namely brahman it is the immutable self luminous reality that transcends all limitations of space and time buddhism challenged this notion of immortal and immutable category on the basis of its radical doctrine of momentariness or chhanagavada it is a unique theory that explains uh, all reality as uh, persistently subject to the law of change accordingly everything in this world is uh, ever in a state of change because nothing remains as it is uh, for any two succeeding moments in the maha parinirvana sutra buddha clearly tells his disciple ananda most people are deluded by the apparent permanence of external objects existence in this world is according to buddha an incessant stream of birth decay and death the whole universe is a constant flow that does not remain static at any point of time this doctrine of momentariness of all existence is obviously similar to the position of the ancient greek thinker heraclitus who asserted that the whole reality is a flux pt raju observes everything is continuously changing nothing exists even for a moment every moment is born stays and dies the same moment according to many buddhist birth life and death are not three moments but only one continuity is only an appearance not the truth according to buddha nothing continues to be the same even for two consecutive moments all things constantly change the similes usually given in buddhist literature are those of the flowing river and the burning flame remember the words of heraclitus one cannot step into the same water twice at no two moments is there the same flame in our daily experience similarity is mistaken for identity for buddha neither being nor non being is real what is real is becoming there is only change and that is only the eternal reality buddha therefore postulated the most fundamental principle of his metaphysics namely anityavada or chhanagavada the aphorism sarvam anityam is regarded as one of the seals of buddhism and since everything is ever changing there cannot be any unchanging substance either material or spiritual hence chhanagavada necessarily implies the denial of a distinct immutable and static self or atman anatmavada with the anityavada forms the crux of a buddhist metaphysics once the skeptic approached buddha and asked whether self exists buddha reply was the meaningful silence again when he asked buddha whether the self does not exist buddha just remained silent his explanation to ananda about this silence is quite enlightening if he had affirmed the existence of the self it would mean his acceptance of eternalism that contradicts anityavada if he had negated it 
annihilationism would be the result. Buddha preferred and preached the middle path between the two. Accordingly, what we conceive as the eternal Atman is nothing but a stream of consciousness or Vijnana Sandhana. Hence, the Buddhist doctrine of no permanent soul is also termed as Nairatmyavada, which means that the soul is nothing but a continuous flow of momentary states of mind. Buddha, beyond any doubt, denied the existence of distinct and static self of anything, including the human beings. This is quite contrary to the Vedantic concept of the self as an eternal and immutable witness to all that we know and do. Change is an inexorable law of all existence and the self is uh, no exception. All individuals are series of momentary states of consciousness. There is no permanent soul behind this series of momentary states of mind. There is only the succession of uh, momentary mental processes. A past mental process has lived, but it neither lives nor will it live. A future mental process will live, but it neither lives nor has it lived. The life of an individual lasts only while a mental process lasts. An individual is a child, a boy, a youth, and an old man. He or she is a succession of change with no identity in his or her body and mind. All existence without any essence and therefore impermanent and transient. This is the universal law. According to the physical and the mental world are devoid of a self or an essence. Anatmavada very often translated as the no soul theory, but it precisely implies uh, the no permanent soul theory. What Buddha persistently pointed out is the problem of our tendency to perceive and conceive the passing moments of consciousness as the fixed and the static entity that we call mind or soul. This is the basic ignorance of the real nature of reality that causes all our miseries and anxieties. In order to explain this ignorance, Buddhist metaphysics had maintained the necessary link between the doctrines of momentariness, impermanence and no permanent soul or Trinigavada, Anityavada and Anatmavada. The concept of Anatman is based on the theory of a dependent origination or Praditya Samutpada. The concept of soul as that which outlives and transcends is an age-old belief in almost all culture of human groups in all times conceived that there exists in man an eternal and permanent entity variously known as soul, self or spirit. It is exactly the concept of the spiritual substance unaffected by the spatio-temporal limitations of the body. Not only the primitive peoples but also sophisticated philosophers subscribe to this belief. Philosophical schools like Vedanta and the theological viewpoints like that of Christianity hold that the soul is the essence of human being. Thus, although human body changes and perishes, the soul remains changeless and immortal, enduring and immutable. The soul in Jainism is known as Jiva and in Hinduism it is termed as Atman. The sharp contrast to these Atman-centric views, Buddhism teaches that there is no permanent and enduring entity either in the physical or in the mental constitution of the human being. According to the theory of dependent origination, everything exists dependently or conditionally. There can be nothing which independently exists as permanent and unchanging. Buddha asked you to examine what are the experience as the soul, all that one could become aware of as the self or soul is a sensation 
an impression, a perception or an image. Never is there the perception of a thing or a substance namely the self or soul. So according to Buddhism, there is no eternal and changeless soul. For Buddha, the conception of such a fixed entity as the soul is a tragic delusion that is to be overcome by the realization of the truth of momentariness and impermanence. The root cause of this Atman sense is nothing but the tendency to name the series of perceptions and experiences as the I. This is the Atman. It is simply the unity of several aggregates that appears to be the I or the self, which is misconceived as the permanent entity that we call Atman. Analyzed properly, the Atman shows itself not as a distinct entity, but as a combination of five aggregates called skandhas, form or matter, feeling like pleasant and unpleasant, perceptions like sight, smell, etc., impulses like hatred, greed, etc., and consciousness. Each one of these skandhas is momentary and transitory in nature and hence there is no meaning in conceiving their temporary combination as a distinct substance that we call Atman. Every one of them is subjected to the law of dependent co-arising or Praditya Samudpada. Hence, there cannot be a distinct substance Atman that is independent of the other entities. The term Atman therefore connotes only the aggregate of five skandhas that changes from moment to moment. A moment in the Buddhist terminology refers to the smallest perceivable fraction of time. A material object is nothing but an aggregate of sense data, a phenomenon. Apart from the color and the taste of an orange, there is no orange. What we refer to as things are only aggregates of a phenomena coexisting. The concept of a soul or a physical substance as the permanent substratum of existence or a thing as the bearer of attributes is only a myth. There is no unity holding together the states or the attributes. What we perceive as the state of mind or as the object of perception are just the combination of name and form or nama and ruba. According to Buddhism, life is a process of becoming and dissolving or arising and passing away. Whatever exists arises from the causes and conditions. The Buddhist conception of reality and human life as mere nama ruba complex is a unique form of a phenomenology. Accordingly, matter is one kind of phenomenological event, a way in which things appear to us in experience. It is not perceivable as a fixed entity outside the subject's mind or sensation. What we perceive is only the aggregate of certain qualities as presented to the mind. Hence, it is clear that Buddhism not only rejects a soul substance, but also a substance and essence behind all things. The Buddhist concept of a matter is based on ruba, which is normally translated as form or body. This notion of reality as we perceive it is explained in terms of a praditya samudpada, the theory of a dependent co-arising. The Pali Nikayas, the Theravada school state, this my body is material, made up from four great elements, born of mother and father, fed on rice and girl, impermanent, liable to be injured and embraced, broken and destroyed. And this is my consciousness which is bound to it and dependent on it. Buddhist metaphysics of material reality maintains that there is no thing 
that is beyond what we perceive and even if such a thing exists, we have no means to comprehend it as it is. Rupa is therefore only a material component in the Buddhist mind body, namely Nama Rupa framework. Hence, Rupa does not refer to matter as such, but to the mode in which mind experiences material reality. Buddhism further affirms that consciousness or Nama arises in dependence on the body and physical processes. Neither the sense data nor the states of consciousness can separately give rise to knowledge. This does not imply mind-body reductionism, which is popularly held by the behaviorist. It means that consciousness requires the body to perform its functions, and the body also needs the mind to complete its own sensory processes. Hence, mind and body are mutually supporting functional systems and each of them needs the other to complete the task of knowing the world. Hence, Buddhism recognizes the mind as the sixth sense organ over and above the five that we recognize as responsible for sense perception. Buddha Kosha in the path of purification compares this necessary correlation between mind and body to the understanding between a blind man and a cripple. Each of them is powerless on his own, but when the cripple sits on the blind man's shoulder, they can walk efficiently as a functional unit. The Buddhist conception of human being and the world as a Nama Rupa complex is exactly the opposite of a Cartesian dualism that holds the ontological or substance bifurcation between mind and body. Now we will discuss the concept of Nirvana. There are three concepts commonly addressed by all the classical Indian systems except Lagayada. They are samsara, human life as bound by the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. Mukti, the scope of liberation from samsara. And third, avidya, the metaphysical ignorance of the ultimate nature of the reality. Both Vedanta and Buddhism stress these concepts in their metaphysical doctrines as well as in the analysis of the human condition in this world. But their approaches are obviously different and this is only the natural to the metaphysical positions that are held radically different. For Vedantins, as it is the material world is only relative and dependent projection of the ultimate reality, which is pure consciousness devoid of any attribute. For Buddhism, what is apparent is not the reality as it is, but its illusory permanence. As we have already explained, what we perceive as the permanent immutable essence of a thing or the static form of consciousness is in fact the unmisconceived stream of consciousness created by the Navarubha format of our knowledge. Both Vedanta and Buddhism prescribe specific means of liberation from our illusory understanding of reality. In the former, it is technically termed moksha and in the latter refers to it as nirvana. Vedantins like Shankara are much concerned with the ignorance of human mind about the essential non-duality of the ultimate reality. Similarly, Buddha had emphasized the normal tendency of human mind to ignore the essential impermanence and momentariness of the phenomena. Nirvana is the means of liberation from this illusory perception of reality. The concept of Nirvana has been a controversial topic for Buddhist and non-Buddhist alike. The main problem in explicating Nirvana lies in the fact that since Nirvana transcends the sense and the intellect, no positive characterization of it is possible. This is what is meant by saying that Nirvana is indescribable. It is a matter of experience rather than 
that of a language and a logic. Hence, no discourse or description of Nirvana, however sharp and illuminating may it be, can be a substitute for the actual experience of it. The term Nirvana literally means blowing out, but it does not mean an annihilation or cessation of existence of life. According to Buddha himself, Nirvana is to be attained here and now while one is still alive. One who had attained Nirvana can and should continue living as the wise guide to those who seek it. The most excellent example can be found in Gautama Buddha himself. Nirvana is the state in which one is completely free from all forms of bondage and attachment. It is the state of perfect insight into the nature of existence. One who had attained Nirvana had once and for all liberated from all the fetters of samsara. That person who had attained Nirvana has attained the perfect wisdom of the impermanence of both the material and the spiritual aspects of a reality. It is necessary here to dispel another popular but false belief about Nirvana. Many scholars and common people think that one who attains Nirvana should keep away from the empirical world and live in a state of a total inactivity and indifference to the world around. This notion of Nirvana is indeed false as it is evident from life of Buddha himself, who after attaining enlightenment was more active not only in preaching the values of a perfect non-injury and loving compassion, but also in caring the sorrowful world. In view of this fact, it is absurd to look at Nirvana as a state of passive indifference. One who attains Nirvana becomes aware of the essentially transient nature of reality and therefore becomes capable of a perfect non-attachment. As the liberated person becomes aware of the law of dependent co-arising, he or she will realize that nothing comes out of nothing and everything in the world is dependent on everything else. At this point of realization, the liberated person will start working voluntarily for the well-being and nirvana of all others around. The nirvanic person is the true follower of Buddha. And for such a liberated soul, there is no need to sit down and meditate for long because engaging in the task of serving the Buddhas around is true meditation. Now we will discuss the concepts of Arhat and Bodhisattva. The concept of Nirvana has been interpreted variously by different Buddhist schools. The difference between the Hinayana school and the Mahayana school is quite obvious in their ontological and epistemological position as well as in their religious practice. We shall see now how the Hinayana Buddhist view of Nirvana is different from that of Mahayana Buddhist. As Mahayanists criticize the aim of a Hinayanist is self-liberation or Nirvana of the individual person. On the contrary, the Mahayanist, the fruits of a liberation are not confined to the individual but should be made available to all sentient beings. The common people, like the monks, should have equal opportunity to attain salvation. Moreover, it is the obligation of the monks to guide the lay people to the path of liberation. With this prescription, Mahayanis break the religious barriers between the monks and the laity. The Hinayana Buddhist used the term Arhat to denote the person who had attained self-liberation from the bondage of cyclic rebirths or samsara. According to Motilal Pandit, an Arhant is a holy person who has realized the state of Nirvana, that is, of extinction, and thereby has freed himself from the fear of suffering. 
It is only a monk by virtue of his access to the monastic discipline who is eligible to attain Nirvana in the strict sense of that term. Anyway, this self-liberation from samsara is also the realization of the truth of the impermanence of the objective world as well as the soul. Mahayana Buddhists maintain their difference of opinion by using the term Bodhisattva for the one who has attained Nirvana. For them, every human being is potentially a Buddha and it is the duty of the enlightened persons to let them realize their Bod Buddhahood. This cosmopolitan view of uh, salvation is the main attraction of uh, Mahayana Buddhism that in due course became popular in countries like China and Japan. Emancipation of all beings is the goal of Bodhisattva. A Bodhisattva does not remain contented with his or her personal liberation, but proceeds to illumine all fellow beings on the truth of Anityam and Anatman. A Bodhisattva is a fully awakened person without any trace of egoism. Hence, it is uh, quite easy and spontaneous for Bodhisattva to live and work for all fellow beings. In this altruistic compassion, the Bodhisattva embraces not only the sentient beings, but the insentient lot also. It is the unconditional realization of universal interdependence and interconnection between one and all. The Mahayana Buddhists regard even the desire of one's own liberation as a selfish and conceives the liberation of all beings as the ultimate goal of spiritual quest. This spiritual resolution is known as a Bodhisattva ideal, which distinguishes the Mahayana concept of Nirvana from the spiritual individualism of a Hinayana school. According to the Mahayana Buddhist, everyone who strives for bodhahood is a potentially a bodhisattva because everyone can become a Buddha. Therefore, the bodhisattva ideal is the preparatory stage to the attainment of a bodhi or enlightenment. The bodhisattva develops the bodhicitta, that is a firm resolution to attain bodhi and to fulfill the mission of Buddha to liberate the world from its all prevalent sorrow. Hence, Bodhisattva must dedicate the whole life in several lives to the service of others and should not care to attain personal salvation before others have attained it. The Bodhisattva ideal is constituted by compassion and wisdom. Out of compassion, the Bodhisattva aspires to emancipate all beings and by means of wisdom, he realizes that in truth no being exists. Bodhisattva needs many qualities to attain the concept of Bodhisattva ideal. Among the many qualities of Bodhisattva, Mahamaitri or great love and Mahakarunya, great compassion are the chief ones. Maitri or love prompts a person to serve others, but Mahamait prompts him to offer everything including his life for the salvation of others. Emancipation of all beings from suffering of death and birth is a great compassion. The Mahayana Buddhism holds that Gautama as a Bodhisattva was moved not by his own suffering, but by the suffering of all human beings. The Buddhist view of a spiritual life includes uh, three main components, morality, meditation, and insight. It is based on the principle of universal suffering and the natural craving of uh, every human being to overcome suffering. Buddhism therefore preaches absolute selflessness and loving compassion as the values to be imbibed by the spiritually perfect individual. The Bodhisattva ideal especially reject 
the separation of salvation from compassion. Nirvana makes no sense if it is devoid of loving kindness. By cultivating the virtue of loving kindness, one can certainly overcome the negative attitude of hatred, hostility, and greed. Both Mahayana and Hinayana schools have accepted four stages of concentration and four attainment as the stages in reaching Nirvana level. The path of Bodhisattva involves ten stages culminating in Jnana Parimitha, perfect knowledge wisdom. Now we will conclude the lecture. From the foregoing discussion, we are able to conclude that Buddhism, there is a perfect synthesis of metaphysics and ethics. For example, the metaphysical doctrines of dependent co-arising or praditya samutpada is the sound basis for the ethical prescription of loving compassion and kindness. If we are all interconnected and interdependent, how is it possible to have an inferior superior division either in nature or in society? This ideal is fulfilled in the Mahayana intention to extend the scope of nirvana to common people without any restriction. The metaphysical principle of uh, momentariness is indeed a reminder of the folly of our inclination to regard certain things as permanent and unchanging. The Buddhist conception of wisdom is in fact a warning against this illusory vision of uh, the flashes of reality as static and eternal. Anatmavada is a radical position of Buddhism that points to the absurd pride of human beings as endured with the highest level of consciousness in the soul. Buddhism leaves no provision for separating the consciousness from the physical aspects of reality. Let us conclude with a reference to the great Mahayana poet saint Sandhideva's analysis of fear. Fear arises because I believe that the self exists. Since the self is illusory, fear is irrational. And when I truly understand this, I shall never be frightened. Thus, there is no body and there is no self. Yes, if everything is dependent on everything else, how can this be my or your body and my or your soul. So, he continues to pray, may the path towards enlightenment be filled with the people. Now, we will look into some assignments. One, describe Chenegavada and Praditya Samutpada. Two, analyze the Buddhist conception of Atman. Three, bring out the concept of Nirvana. 4. State the positive and the negative aspects of a Nirvana. And 5. Bring out the concept of Bodhisattva in Buddhism. Some of the references for further study. Indian Philosophy, Volume 1 by Dr. S. Radhakrishnan. A History of Indian Philosophy, 5 volumes by Das Gupta Surendranath. History of a Pre-Buddhistic Indian Philosophy, by B. M. Baru. A Survey of Buddhism, Indian Institute of Culture by Bhikshu Sagariga Chida. Both sessions on Buddhism I think was beneficial. Thank you for watching.